Father Alexander, also known as Reverend Dr. Alexander, St. Bartholomew, London. All I need is a soundtrack. <laughs> My people are destroyed. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's... Are we recording, please? Yes. All right, sorry. Take sorry, two. Take start two. again. Start again. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children prophecy of Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. A house once inhabited, now left in ruins on a flat, grey, lifeless field, sheltered by skeletal trees, over a bleak horizon, clouds mingling with smoke. The only proof that anyone ever lived here, except the forsaken shack itself, is the sign, Toxic Land. This is the Orthodox Church when we are ignorant of the Orthodox faith. This is the hollow shell that we call Orthodoxy. Not the living church, but some accident of ancestry and customs, half pagan prejudice and superstition that is in fact a caricature of Christianity. Nature hates a vacuum. If we do not know what the church teaches, we shall make it up. If we neglect the doctrinal content of the true worship, it becomes false. If we do not recognize doctrine in a holy icon, it becomes an idol. Our neglected offspring drift away from the true faith and fall prey to the wolf of souls. Toxic land, indeed. To label yourself orthodox but make no effort to learn what our Holy Mother the Church teaches is to be a hypocrite. An orthodox priest who refuses even to teach the basics of the faith, whether to hide his own ignorance or worse yet, to keep his congregation submissive, is a wicked shepherd. According to the prophet Ezekiel, God shall rescue his flock from the imposters. Ezekiel 34.10 Ignorance is therefore no mere accident of culture or age. Ignorance is a sin. It is literally amartia, missing the mark. The mark is our salvation. Ignorance is not a question of not knowing. Merely informing a parish of this or that abstractly, academically, as it were, cannot heal the wound of ignorance. Ignorance means not wanting to know. To allow any orthodox community to slide into blind habits, tribal bigotries, and gross misconceptions is to degrade it. What then do we need to know in order to be orthodox in a conscious, honest sense? What is the divine purpose of everything we learn Metania. Awkwardly translated as repentance, metania is in fact the process of going beyond, meta, habitual structures of thinking, viania, in order to attain the vision of God. Meta here is very significant, as in metaphysics or metamorphosis. Learning the faith dares us to challenge old habits and dispel old illusions. It is not conservative, it is traditional. Actively, dynamically, we pass on the collective experience of the church that no academic scribe can squeeze into a system or rule-bound Pharisee petrify into a code. Orthodox learning is therefore not informative, it is transformative. The first word of our Lord's preaching is metanite, repent, Matthew 3, 2. Go beyond your ego, your 
trivial thoughts, your provincial customs or petty habits. In short, change. No learning is really orthodox that does not in some way change the one who learns. No learning is truly orthodox that does not inspire us to love God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. Matthew 22, 37. First then, the fruits of ignorance. This is part of the why of learning the holy faith. Before considering what we need to learn to be consciously orthodox, we should first identify what keeps us unconscious, the debris that we need to sweep away. Tell a stranger at a bus stop that you are orthodox. Do not append Christian or preface with Eastern. Is this what comes to mind? <laughs> Least the beard fits. No, you respond, we are not Haredi Jews. Oh, says the stranger, do you mean Greek Orthodox? <laughs> or perhaps Russian Orthodox? <laughs> In 55 years that have passed since Timothy Ware published The Orthodox Church in 1963, the Christian adjective Orthodox remains indelibly linked in the popular mind with perceived ethnic tribes or foreign states. On the other hand, is this Orthodoxy? A crumbling established church by another name. Nostalgic, rather backward looking, average age attending, at least 61. Are we then merely a conservative ro rebound romance, an antiquarian's curiosity? What has any of this to do with Christ? The fire of the gospel trampling down death by death. Are we accidental? or essential, temporal, or eternal. Once we've decided to play an ethnicity card, whatever ethnicity it may be, we have replaced the empty tomb with the full belly. <laughs> <laughs> Approachable? Yes. Undogmatic? Surely. Fit for a secular order in which religion is an accident of culture? In truth, numbers may abound where, like Mercedes or Zakuski on our plate, the Lamb of God, who struggles to discern the will of the Father, who is without beginning, is always alone. His are the few. Whether you label yourself Lebanese or Syrian, Russian or Ukrainian, Greek or Georgian, Romanian or Al Bulgarian, Serbian or Albanian, Polish or Czech, or for that matter, English, Welsh, Cornish, Scottish, Irish, Manx, if you are truly Orthodox, you have only one fundamental identity. It is not some generic, nondescript Christianity. It is a sacramental identity in the Orthodox Church. In the instant you receive the precious gifts of the life-giving body and blood of Christ our God, you are authentically yourself. Every element of your earthly heritage that detracts from this identity is an idol. Every organic, indeed folkloric inheritance that enhances it makes you akin to every orthodox communicant in all ages. The goal of Orthodox learning is to form sacramental identity. It has no other. The command to learn. That is the what not of learning the faith. Since the what, that is the doctrinal content of the faith, is inseparable from the how and the who, firstly we should consider the when and the when the history and context of learning the faith. It is a good measure of how far we have strayed from the mind of the fathers that sometimes we imagine learning the faith to consist of two tasks, providing researchers with materials and teaching children how to behave. Both notions reinforce tired secular stereotypes 
that religion is a set of dead customs from an unenlightened age fit only for shaping brats into law-abiding citizens. Religion may be, faith is not. Faith begins with the command to follow. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, Genesis 12, 1. Uproot, obey, trust in the unseen voice that promises the impossible. Is this not the birth of learning, the itch in the mind, the hunger in the heart? Were it for Ab Abraham's courage, were it not for Abraham's courage, would the people of God have the ears to hear what the identical unseen voice commands through the prophet Moses? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Deuteronomy 6.5 All the divine commandments, including loving one's neighbor, hinge on the first and greatest. Love God. Hold nothing back. Devote all the power of your being to recognizing him. Hence, a prophet holds the law in his right hand. God incarnate holds the word in his left. But with his right hand, he blesses. We learn less from books than blessings. Learning the faith is thus inseparable from the wellspring of the faith itself. As Christ, our true God, roams the dirt roads of Galilee, Judea, and beyond, is it in order to seek blind eyes to open or lame limbs to unbend? Does he conduct research or teach the young to behave? No. He proclaims the kingdom, the kingship of God. He declares and shows has erupted into the world. Before ascending into the heavens, he commissions the twelve explicitly, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Make disciples, that is, learners, mathites, not the merely curious, but fresh newborn souls. Proclaim the kingdom simultaneously by instructing in true doctrine and imparting the holy mysteries. As if the command of God were not enough, Canon 58 of the Holy Apostles is explicit and uncompromising. If any bishop or presbyter neglects the clergy or the people, and does not instruct them in the way of godliness, let him be excommunicated. And if he persists in this negligence of idleness, let him be deposed. Do not let the words, all that I have commanded you, or the way of godliness, deceive you. Christ commands primarily through parables or paradoxes, not thou shalt not. The way of godliness is not a code. It is first and foremost an act of worship. The what of learning is manifested primarily in the worshiping of who? Both the overseer, the bishop, and the elders of Israel, the priests, share this apostolic duty to manifest the kingdom. A very brief history of catechesis. The what being as old as the when, the holy apostles and fathers instruct us in the priorities of learning the faith. Anyone who has ever taught our orthodox faith in the 20th or 21st centuries know that they still apply. Like his incarnate Lord, the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, is both preacher and teacher. He does not lower homilies to lectures, but rather elevates lessons to homilies, if not poems. Barren rhetoric is not enough. Speaking with the tongues of men and of angels, 1 Corinthians 13.1, as indeed he does, love obliges him to search out what believers need to know and instruct them. 
passing through northern Anatolia south, south, southwards toward Ephesus, he asks one group of Christians, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They reply, No, we have never even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized? The Holy <coughs> Apostle asked. <coughs> Considering how many cradle Orthodox and converts receive the Holy Spirit in chrism without knowing that there is one, we too should identify what do we need to learn. Question. Dispel confusion. Reveal what is true. This is the apostolic method of teaching the faith. As direct heirs of the apostles, the apologists and apostolic fathers of the first two centuries teach by word of mouth, not on account of literary, literacy levels, but in order to foster intimate bonds. Bonds between master and disciples. The word catechesis, hence catechism and catechumen, derives from kata, down, and ichos, a sound, hence echo. It is a Christian, it is a sound that flows downward. The normal mode of Christian learning is therefore not solitary reading, but word of mouth. A live speaker addresses a live audience. Our models among the early fathers do not separate teaching from healing. In imparting words of truth, the saint in question challenges delusions of unbelief. Over the first four centuries, including the age of St. Justin Martyr, instructors had pr prospective Christians, catechumens or hearers, memorize the prayers, especially the Our Father. Understanding the holy mysteries, often called sacraments, went hand in hand. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, who fell asleep in 386, emphasizes baptism and the divine liturgy inseparably, the latter fulfilling the former. As we shall see shortly, in the 28 years that I have been catechizing, I required my catechumens to purchase a hardbound prayer book and commit to memory as many daily prayers as possible. By the 4th century, amid all the doctrinal controversies surrounding the First Ecumenical Council in 325, an order of catechists had developed. This lower order, alongside subdeacon, reader, doorkeeper, and ex exorcist, among others, devoted itself to instructing catechumens over three years. Traditionally, the bishop or priest then received them on the night of Pascha. This link with exorcism and the act of trampling down death is no accident. No lesser in authority than St. John Chrysostom, 349 to 407, considers catechesis a form of exorcism, expelling the spirits of doctrinal error to make room for the spirit of truth. By the 6th century, rigorous catechesis began to decline as infants exceeded the number of adults in the numbers baptized. To this day, however, a sponsor is called upon to renounce the father of lies on behalf of the infant. The Orthodox Church has never severed the links between learning and truth. How could it without renouncing the way, the truth, and the life? <coughs> From the record of the first six Christian centuries, it is evident that learning is not merely informative, it is fully transformative. One type of person, pagan or heretic, becomes another, a full sacramental member of the Orthodox Church. Teaching authority rests exclusively with the bishops and priests, that heir is the heirs of the apostles, not academic experts. Bishops and priests may delegate the role to lay or lower order catechists, as Western Christians often do. Ancient catechesis, however, was not a mere training in moral behavior, as some pietist Protestant models make it. Above all, it was, and rightly still is, immersion in the spirit of worship. In a word, catechesis 
in the spirit of the fathers and of the Orthodox Church is the lengthy organic process of shaping liturgical beings. <coughs> Persons whose minds and bodies live on the divine liturgy and other mysteries of the church. If the core of your being is not there, you are not catechized. Finally, two case studies based on my own parish, because that is what I know. Church school, educating children. Now for the what, the how, and the who. Practical model of orthodox learning. What springs to mind most immediately when we think of learning the faith? Is it not Sunday school? Or perhaps parochial school? Children learning Bible stories or young teens memorizing catechisms usually seem to be the only two models of Christian learning in either East or West. As we shall see, the learning community is not at all that simple. Forming a child a preschool or school age in the faith, however, is undoubtedly one of the first priorities of any Orthodox community. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it, as the book of Proverbs asserts. Forming young children in faith and reinforcing it in the teen years, the earlier you begin, the better, invests in our own spiritual future. In our parish in London, which consists mainly of young adults, a subdeacon, <laughs> organizes the education of the young. Overseen by a parish priest, of course, this practice is consistent with the historical role of the generalized diaconate, wider than the current office of deacon alone. As the father of two young children, he knows firsthand how challenging it can be raising orthodox youngsters in an aggressively secular city. A rota of parents takes turns reading the gospel of the particular Sunday aloud, then organizing activities based on it according to the age and developmental level of the young child. Focus on the gospel and the liturgical calendar, the lessons and activities instill the rhythm of sacred events. The children act out the gospel as the adults narrate, illustrate the stories, or engage in relevant crafts, including weaving palm crosses and painting possible eggs. The subdeacon discusses daily prayer with both the, the children and the parents, who are present, imparting solid church doctrine, theology, in the context of worship. The parents present ask as many questions <clears throat> as the children. When in doubt concerning weighty matters of doctrine, the subdeacon always consults with the priest, who has been teaching Orthodox doctrine for over 28 years. Ours is no folk parish, which uses its church school as a creche. We water our seeds. The materials in our church school derive primarily from the Orthodox Church in America, OCA, from the Monastery of St. John the Baptist in Tolchard Knights, Essex, and occasionally from our archdiocese. Relying on materials from America simply reflects the sheer number of Orthodox publishers and seminaries in a continent where annual Orthodox communicants out outnumber the UK three to one. Furthermore, Orthodox divine services and even parish records have used English in the territories of what now are the United States and Canada from as early as 1812. Finally, catechizing adults. And last we come to the very core of Christian education in the parish. Note, the very core is not educating the small children. Forming or transforming adults. Ever since the baptism of infants became a norm in the sixth century, adult catechesis has often seemed strange if not redundant to certain Orthodox clergy and laity. Surely adults arrive in a parish fully formed. A few will seem better educated than the priest. All the more need to catechize them. 
In acquiring the mind of the church, academic and professional qualifications as such count for nothing. A learned biblical scholar, such as a certain Arius, is more off limits than a completely illiterate person of faith. And indeed, about as off limits as a fox among chickens. It is the duty of the bold St. Nicholas to slap him down. Those formed in a worldview, nominally Christian or not, at odds with the teaching of the Orthodox Church, require more catechesis, not less. It is potentially toxic waste, which infects impressionable souls. The principle applies equally to ordinary churchgoers who assume that they already know what being a Christian means. A lifetime outside the Orthodox Church in a sect founded by men ingrains its own blind habits and very often its own tribal bigotries exactly parallel to those of our own uninformed cradle people. A mind locked into its own petty provincial prejudices for example, against holy icons, against the sign of the cross, against the most holy Theotokos, for example, can become orthodox in body, but never in soul. It is the duty of real catechesis to transform such a mindset into an orthodox mindset. Please note carefully that I shun the labels cradle and convert in this context. There is no such two-tier system in the true practice of the Orthodox faith. Any child of Orthodox parents, a pious progeny of an Orthodox heritage, who decides in her 80th year to learn the faith, is a convert. Any offspring of unbelievers or false believers who integrates himself fully into the life of Holy Church is cradle. Anointed with the Holy Chrism, he shares in the same precious body and blood, indeed sometimes consecrates it. There is only one legitimate distinction among members of the Orthodox Church, conscious versus unconscious. Hence the how, who, and what of Orthodox learning, the way in which I have catechized for 28 years. That's a lecture, not catechesis. But I like the picture. <laughs> Generally don't like my own picture. Over the years, naturally, I have honed my techniques and adapted material to a variety of parish situations. No one size fits all. A handful of principles always applies. Metania. Integration. Immersion. I catechize not in order to inform, but transform heterodox minds into orthodox. I strive to integrate every newcomer, any newcomer, or uninstructed cradle adult into my specific, concrete, flesh and blood parish community. My primary aim, however, has always been to nurture liturgical beings those whose hearts beat above all to the pulse of the divine liturgy, the yearly cycle of feasts and fasts, and the internal rhythms of orthodox prayer. When a stranger visits my parish, or more frequently these days, emails me with a view to visiting, firstly, I discern whether this is a tourist, a casual inquirer, or a spiritual seeker. One can often a uh, shift among these categories in the course of a very short time. If, if a mere tourist inquires, I direct him or her to our interactive website. I do not recommend books or agree to meet in person. Faith is communal, not private. If the inquirer seems at all serious, I invite him or her to visit, get a feel for our worship, and meet our people over lunch, which we have every single Sunday. If the inquirer has visited in person, I give him my illustrated business card with email, phone, and time of services. I always inform anyone who speaks of converting 
that the process takes time. An inquirer must first get to know the who, us, before embarking on the what. If said inquirer visits at least three or four times consecutively and asserts that he desires to join, I send him a PDF called Becoming a Catechumen. In simple terms, this file outlines the stages of entering the Orthodox Church as an adult. The inquirer must comply with conditions, including attending divine liturgy every Sunday, if at all physically possible, and no services at all outside the Orthodox Church. He must attend weekly catechesis, purchase a hardbound Orthodox prayer book, People respect hardbound books, <laughs> even in this internet age. Ideally, one with the divine liturgy. And he must not belong to any social organization which by its nature, that is, atheist, racist, or anti-immigrant, militates against the interests of the Orthodox people. If the inquirer then complies in writing, on the next Sunday, I summon him forward in front of the congregation toward the end of the Divine Liturgy. I lay my hand upon his head and read the prayer for admitting catechumens. Note, he is not yet received. He is only admitted as a catechumen. As a rule, my course of weekly catechesis lasts 12 months that is, one year. The catechumen may withdraw at any time. Should the catechumen fail to comply with the conditions, the catechist may cause him to withdraw. Rigorous as the process may seem in this consumerist age, I have retained more catechumens as faithful orthodox since applying these standards than ever before. Catechetical talks take place in our parish hall on Sunday afternoons after we finish lunch. You should bear in mind that we have use of our church and parish hall between 9 and 3 on a Sunday, unless someone is willing to shell out a few extra hundred pounds. Since Orthodox catechumens often or since Orthodox communicants, since cradle Orthodox communicants, often are uninformed and hungry, I invite everyone, even plain inquirers, to sit in. Catechumens, however, enjoy the right to ask questions first. The sequence of approximately 15 lessons follows the time-honored practice of Saints Justin Martyr, Cyril of Jerusalem, and John Chrysostom by ingraining the spirit of our worship long before anything historical or potentially antiquarian. The Orthodox Church is not dead, it is alive. The Orthodox Church, above all, is her worship. Etiquette, the first lesson. A catechumen learns how to address the clergy and how to ask for a priest and a bishop's blessing. Exactly. <laughs> Did you go too far? Go back. There. Ask for a bishop's blessing. Think you know the bishop. He begins thinking about finding a patron saint and a sponsor and the need for coming to confession before he is received. Worship. The catechumen learns how and when the sign of the cross is made in the divine services, how to enter and exit the temple, and when to stand or to bow. From the second lesson to the last, I bring a holy icon to venerate. Once they learn how, all catechumens, no matter how advanced, practice venerating a holy icon at every lesson. Divine liturgy. The catechumen learns the principles of liturgical worship, the parts of the church temple, and of the divine liturgy step by step. By this lesson, attending the divine liturgy or other services should have become a habit. Receiving the precious gifts. The catechumen learns how rightly to receive the precious and life-giving body and blood and how to do it correctly. 
the priest catechist uses ordinary bread, wine, and a spoon to demonstrate so that by the time they receive the precious body and blood, there will be no awkwardness, fear, or accidents. Prayer. Already keeping a simple rule of prayer, the catechumen learns about morning and evening prayer, the Jesus prayer, and when and where to pray spontaneously in her or her own words. Symbol of faith. Having sowed the spirited forms of our divine lit worship, the priest catechist now addresses the explicit doctrinal content. The catechumen considers each phrase of the symbol of faith, or creed, as the text that summarizes Christian belief. He also learns to call it the symbol of faith, not the creed. Dogmas of the Ecumenical Councils. The catechumen learns, does not memorize, but becomes acquainted with all the official dogmas of the seven generally recognized ecumenical councils. From the First Council of Nicaea in 325 to the Second Council of Nicaea in 787, the priest catechist provides mnemonic devices to recall each dogma, such as the virgin is the Theotokos. Whoever denies this dogma is a heretic. Council of Ephesus, of course. Tradition, including holy scriptures. The catechumen learns to distinguish paradosis, tradition, from folklore, and how the holy scriptures fit into holy tradition as the written record of God's revelation. He learns about the canon, how to read it using the eyes of the church, and the merits and flaws of various common translations into English. Holy Mysteries. The catechumen learns about the chief seven mysteries. Chief seven mysteries. There is no limit to the number of mysteries, contrary to Peter Lombard. From baptism to anointing of the sick, with a specific special focus on confession. The priest catechist employs one of the faithful to demonstrate in front of the catechumen or catechumens how to come to confession, explains the seal, and assures the catechumen that there is never anything to fear. The priest, the worst sinner, does not judge but heals. Saints, including relics, holy icons. By this late stage, the catechumen is accustomed to venerating the holy icons at home and in church. Now the priest explains the nine ranks of the saints in proscomedia, various types of martyrdom, and the purpose of pilgrimage to holy sites and to the relics of glorified saints. He explains the necessity of revering our holy icons and how to pray for the departed. Even if people are accustomed to doing this, Repetition is the mother of sons. Marriage and bioethics. This is a controversial, therefore a very popular topic. The catechumen learns the parallel between marriage and monasticism in our journey toward theosis. Yes. The sacred nature of sexuality and the body and what the church teaches concerning mixed marriage, abortion, euthanasia, and similar current and often sensitive topics. Patriarchates, especially Antioch. The catechumen learns that there is only one Orthodox Church governed locally in patriarchates and similar provincial structures. He learns what it means to be in communion and why it is inconceivable, unthinkable, to commit intercommunion with those outside the Holy Orthodox Church. He learns a brief history of the Holy See of Antioch from its apostolic era through John of Damascus. I have to cut off somewhere. Well, we're the cut off. Hmm. Humility and the seal. The last catechetical class focuses on the right attitude of humility the gift of receiving, not imposing, that will enable the catechumen to fulfill his or her unique calling in the Orthodox Church. 
he learns that some ignorant folk will not recognize this new identity, while others will not expect them, him to find it. This dilemma results from two types of pride that afflict the Holy Orthodox Church, especially in the West. Philatism and pseudomorphosis. The first, mixing tribal identity with sacred, imposes notions of being Greek or Russian or Romanian or Galician or Bukovinian or from that side of the village or from this side of the mountain, for example, on the sacred font and the chalice. The second, unwilling to shed old Latin or Protestant baggage, proudly dons an Orthodox dress but not an Orthodox nature. It assumes a false form, pseudo, pseudo, plus morphe, the pseudo-morph. After almost 30 years of catechizing, I am not interested in bums on seats, the commercial principle of selling to crowds. My only interest in catechizing lies in helping in my small way to shape a single, sincere, humble, orthodox soul. When an adult who has come to the church and journeyed with me these long 12 months receives the holy chrism, I always embrace this new brother or sister and say, welcome home. Why such strenuous, time-consuming efforts in instructing adults? Because it is the adults who instruct the children. You cannot give what you do not have. Once learners of any age or level, preschoolers to professors, and I have taught both at various times, completes an appropriate stage of learning, does it stop? Never. When your learning stops, your faith stops. After 15 or so weeks of catechesis, my catechumens attend church and integrate into my community for 37 weeks of the year. Many former catechumens joyously attend my catechetical classes for years after they've been received. And I ask, what are you still doing here? And she said, I like it. <laughs> Do they ever stop learning? The priest never does. Neither does the bishop. The only three glorified saints who bear the exalted title O Theologos, the theologian, John the Apostle and Evangelist, Gregory of Nazianzus, and the ironically named Simeon, the new theologian, a firebrand like me, are all students of theology. That is all a human being can be, a student of theology. Theology being not a subject, but a person. A last reflection about always learning. Finally, is there no place for private study, reading books, obtaining degrees, watching, may God help us, YouTube videos, and other doctrinally infallible sources floating in cyberspace? <laughs> My relatively young congregation, here's a few of them, a handful of whom you see here, spends as much time online as most young people today. Two of my three over 70s are not, computer, not particularly computer illiterate and certainly read voraciously. Having in my own house, which is getting much too small to sleep in, a library that scrapes the ceiling and having obtained as many degrees as universities offer, I'm hardly hostile to reading. When someone in my community and beyond asks a question about the faith, sometimes I even remember where to look. Private studies, however, cannot conceivably replace the traditional models of learning in an orthodox community, word of mouth, one-on-one -on -one, or in a group. Homilies on the gospel, a liturgical and prophetic event, and therefore never a Sunday school class or a lecture, teach as the divine liturgy teaches, 
by showing forth truth and emblazoning him upon the soul. That is not the word of mouth in question. Catechesis of the young and the old unfolds the dark saying, Psalm 77 2, of the great mystery of our salvation, explicitly and systematically, bringing to the level of the conscious mind what we have, may have absorbed unconsciously, should have absorbed in the divine services or in prayer at home. At its best, it is a light that dispels shades. It never substitutes for spiritual eyes, only fits them with spectacles. Eyeglasses help us to focus on what is already there, lest we make a monkey of ourselves. If we love God with all our mind, Luke 10, 27, how can we fail to seek his face under all circumstances? Is not learning them in all its varied forms not simply a synonym for metania, going beyond habitual patterns of thought toward an accurate vision of him who calls us by name? In the garden outside the sepulchre, Mary Magdalene mistakes an elusive stranger for the gardener. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Many disciples, many apostles, one teacher. Thank you.